So we have two days ahead of us with presentations, discussion, uh, networking opportunities. So let's get learning. So our opening keynote speaker today is Doug Laney. And uh, Doug has actually spoken for us before at one of our virtual data summit conferences. So he has moved beyond being a little square and a Zoom presentation to a real live person. So this is very exciting. Um, Doug's a best-selling author, recognized authority on data and analytics strategies. Uh, he's working for uh, Wes Monroe. Monroe West, I got that wrong, didn't I? <laughs> um, and he also has brought some books with him, being this best-selling author that he is. Um, and we will be having a bit of a raffle at the end of his talk. So hang around and maybe you'll get a book. So let me introduce Doug, who is going to talk about data is not the new oil, even though you may have heard something like that. So please welcome Doug. Well, a slight, slight correction, Mary, I, I definitely am a little square. I've been, <laughs> have been, have been for years, so. Um, Anyway, great to be here. Uh, thanks for, for having us. Good morning to all of you. Um, yes, we're going to talk about this topic of, of whether data is a new oil and, and how it um, kind of meets the criteria, perhaps an asset, and how it's used by organizations uh, increasingly a, as, an, as an asset. Um, there's, uh, you know, a few years ago, The Economist proclaimed data the, the new oil, right? And uh, hundreds of other consultants and uh, what we might call thought followers. <laughs> and others have jumped on and, and parroted uh, this meme. Certainly, uh, the proclamation underscores um, data's increasing value in, in organizations, but entirely misses the point that data has unique characteristics which make it potentially much more valuable than, than oil. So. Uh, we see all sorts of <clears throat> people proclaiming data is the new oil, data is the new bacon, data is the new plutonium, you know, whatever you want to <laughs> call it. Um, so my, my perspective on that for fans of The Princess Bride is, uh, so my name is not Inigo Montoya and you did not kill my father, but um, re by repeating this, this tired and inaccurate meme that data is the new oil, um, you're killing the broader and deeper opportunities to generate revenue streams from it, and I will, I will explain. Uh, so first, let's acknowledge that there are some similarities very, uh, between data and oil, which admittedly you know, definitely are, are a few. It seems, however, that these characteristics uh, are ones that continue to uh, distract data professionals and business leaders from realizing data's full, full potential. So let's look at the commonalities. Yes, of course, data can be acquired, but uh, many companies are, are aware that unlike oil, data can be acquired or harvested or licensed. Um, we can acquire it in a variety of different, for, different ways. We can manufacture it, um, but, but very often we're collecting it or harvesting it from some kind of source. So um, there definitely uh, you are, are a variety of ways to, to, to gather data. We can gather data from uh, tens of billions of websites. Um, I think there's almost a trillion websites out there. Um, you can harvest data or collect data from billions of social media posts. You can harvest it or collect it or exchange it from your with your uh, dozens or hundreds of business partners. You can gather it, of course, from customers. There are at least 5,000 data brokers out there who have data that you can, you can harvest. So companies tend to get very fixated on their own data, but um, we'll talk about that in a bit, but just understand that there are a variety of uh, places to gather data today that, that um, particularly when integrated, can provide uh, uh, inc incredible value. Um, uh, yes, of course, data can and must be refined in various ways to become usable and consumable as part of a business process, and of course, this involves integrating and cleansing, enriching it in various ways for particular purposes, so again, another commonality between data and, and oil. And like data and oil, uh, it has to be stored in some way. Um, this is just one of the ways that we store oil. Data, oil uh, can be stored in, in a variety of ways, but this is the one that we're most familiar with. Uh, and then it's piped to those who are using or consuming it. Uh, for those of you who are data architects or are in, involved in data ops, uh, this level of piping is quite simplistic, isn't it? <laughs> Compared to the way that we, we, uh, uh, we, we pipe data to, uh, to applications and, and business people. Um, one of the interesting things about the way we're piping data today is increasingly, um, this gets into some other economic uh, concepts that I've been studying, 
which is that the, increasingly the primary users or consumers of, of data are, are applications and processes, not people. So the way that we've been designing and architecting uh, data pipelines for years to direct data at eyeballs perhaps is not as relevant as uh, some new ways of, uh, of architecting data solutions to pipe or plumb data to business processes themselves. Um, then, of course, we make it accessible to those who are, who are consuming it. Um, it can be purchased, however, more often data is licensed uh, or, or uh, its rights are conveyed to others to use. So we can purchase or access data in a, in a variety of ways and uh, increasingly organizations are thinking about um, a, a range of different methods for making data available to not only to users but also to uh, applications inside and outside their, their organization. Uh, then, of course, data like oil is used in fueling business processes. There's no, no doubt in that. In fact, um, I actually contend that data ought to be considered the fifth factor of production in addition to uh, land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. Um, in fact, very often data is a substitute for one or more of those, um, those other factors of production. And data like oil can be processed and transformed into different kinds of products, not just kind of the traditional uh, products that we think of We're, when we think of Using data, we're often thinking of dashboards or maybe AI or advanced analytics, but there are a variety of ways that we can package and process data into new kinds of, of data products. And yes, they can both be spilled, um, arguably. However, unlike oil, which um, can somewhat be cleaned up, when you spill data, it cannot be cleaned up uh, at all, very, very well at all. So um, that's kind of where our differences between data and, and oil uh, or the similarities between data and oil end. And so now let's talk, about the, uh, let's talk about the differences. And I think these differences are really important because the companies that are capitalizing on them we'll see are the ones who are thriving, um, not just surviving, but thriving in the uh, economy today. So first let's look at what happens when we use a drop of oil versus when we use a unit of data, say a transaction or a customer record. When you consume oil, it, 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 uh, it depletes. There I got a little thing there. So oil will deplete when we use it, but however when we use uh, data or information here, um, it continues to, um, to exist and, and persist. So it doesn't deplete. Now some people may, may ask, well doesn't it, um, doesn't it depreciate? Um, that's a longer kind of discussion. Yes, sometimes an individual data record can depreciate, but if we think of a data as a set of data or as a uh, logical grouping of data, and if we're an ongoing concern, then that data actually can appreciate over time as we enrich it, as we add records to it, um, and as we, ex as we extend it. So um, the question as to whether data depreciates, perhaps a single record may depreciate, but taken as a whole, a, a portfolio of data typically will appreciate, not, not depreciate. Longer topic uh, of discussion. So what we say is that data is a non-depleting asset, whereas oil is a, depl is a depleting asset. Um, when you use a, a, a drop of oil, it gets, it gets used up, but not like data. Which gets us to the second major difference, which is when a drop of oil is being used, how many different ways can we use that drop of oil um, compared to a unit of data? Well, um, we can use that drop of oil really only one way. Once somebody is using that drop of oil, once some process a machine is consuming that, uh, that drop of oil, no other process can, can really use it. There pro perhaps are some exceptions, but generally when we're talking about the consumption of oil, uh, we can only use it one way at a time. Data, however, can be used, the same unit of data um, can be used multiple ways uh, simultaneously, and that's what we refer to as data being non-rivalrous. Um, so that's the, the, the second major, major difference. Um, so you can see the advantages for an organization who identifies ways to use data in multiple ways rather than just like building a pretty pie chart or bouncy bar charts you know, with it. And then the third one is that um, w between oil and data is that w what they produce when we use them. So what, what gets produced when we use oil is, um, well, let's start with the data. What gets produced when we use data is, is uh, very often more data, right? Um, data is what um, economists would call a a progenitive asset that is one that creates more of itself when we use it. So think about anywhere that you're using data in, in your organization and you're typically, especially if you're using it for automation or optimization of some kind, it's typically creating more data about you know, where, whenever and wherever it's used. And I'm not just talking about like log, log data, but data uh, in the form of the outcomes that are produced whenever we use that, uh, use that data. 
Oil, on the other hand, you know, when we use it, creates uh, heat, creates energy, and creates pollutants. So uh, not quite as a sustainable resource either uh, if you're considering using more sustainable resources. So data, again, is what we would call a, uh, a progenitive asset or regenerative a asset. It doesn't necessarily regenerate itself, but it progenerates, it creates more uh, 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 other, kinds of other kinds of data. So those are our three main differences between data and oil, and I think that these main differences are really what we should be focused on, not on the similarities or commonalities between oil and data. Um, yes, for architecting solutions, maybe we want to think about those commonalities. We definitely do want to apply asset management principles and practices to the way that we're managing data, but um, I think when it comes to taking full advantage of data, we really need to be focused on these, uh, capitalizing on these unique economic properties of, of data. All right. So this kind of takes us back to the genesis of, of the, the concept of infonomics. Um, I tell a story about, um, I was a, an, an analyst with Gartner, and uh, after the 9-11 terror attacks, some clients started contacting us lamenting not only the tragic loss of life, but also the loss of their data, right? Um, uh, this is in the days before cloud and offsite backups, and so organizations actually lost lost their data. So naturally, what do you do when you suffer you know, some, some kind of loss? Who, who do you call? Anyone? Insurance company, right, so you call your insurance company. And the insurance companies uh, roundly denied these claims, suggesting that the data wasn't considered property, therefore it wasn't covered by your PNC policies. I don't know if anyone ever had that, that experience after 9-11. Um, but uh, any, anyone in the room, but but that's that's what happened. So that kind of came to our attention at Gartner, and we thought, well, goodness, isn't isn't data property? Doesn't it meet the you know, criteria? What property is? Isn't isn't it an, an, an asset? Well, what ended up happening was there were a number of, of court cases um, around whether data should be considered property or not. Even today, the courts are still thoroughly confused as to whether data constitutes property. Some courts have said, well, yeah, data should be considered property because we can. Uh, we can display it, or, or we can print it, or it can be represented by bubbles on an optical disk, right, physically. And others have suggested that data shouldn't be considered uh, property because uh, um, electrons have negligible mass. <laughs> Yep, so that's uh, some of the court rulings. So they're all over the map still. Uh, yes, there are regulations that can be enforced in the courts, but as far as general laws related to whether data constitutes property, we're still kind of in the, in the gray zone there. Um, so then the insurance industry, what did it do? Well, the insurance industry recognized it was a bit exposed, so they updated the commercial general liability policy template used by most insurance companies to explicitly exclude um, data or, or exclude data from um, from being included on, on PNC policies. Um, the insurance service office did that. Um, any guess when 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 they made that change? No. A month after 9/11. Not to be outdone, the accounting profession followed suit a few years later and said, well, if the insurance companies aren't going to recognize, or the insurance industry is not going to recognize data as property, then we're not going to recognize it as an asset. And so the insurance, uh, sorry, the, the accounting profession uh, updated a key financial standard, uh, FAS 38, which deals with how to recognize certain kinds of intangibles, uh, and now expressly stated that uh, data can't be capitalized. So. Um, uh, to add further you know, insult to injury. And then um, the U.S. government gets involved and they have a hearing on how to evolve a 1930s style accounting system into the 21st century. You know, why a 1930s style accounting system? Well, that's when the SEC was formed by the then nascent, uh, 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 SEC was formed. And, um, and, and at that time, you know, they, they formed the SEC to solve the issues about reporting coming out of the Great Depression, and the SEC said, here's how we're going to standardize financial statements, and here are the asset classes. Well, the asset classes didn't include data, because data was all physical at that time. It was considered, it was, you know, it was books, magazines, ledgers, et cetera. So there's no real reason to think about data as a separate kind of asset at that time. So here we are 90 years later, and the keepers of what constitutes data and what constitutes, uh, what constitutes an asset and what constitutes uh, a property uh, really have doubled down on their antiquated notions that, that data is you know, neither one. Um, the U.S. Senate hearing um, 
there were a number of people who testified, you know, big, big six or big eight accountants testified that um, because we can't recognize certain c kinds of intangibles like data, it's creating undue market volatility and a lack of transparency into businesses for valuation purposes and, and so forth and investment purposes. Um, and because it was a, a U.S. Senate um, committee hearing, uh, can anyone guess what the outcome of that was? Nothing, right? So, <laughs> again, <laughs> well, that's where we are. That's where we are today. Um, and so, uh, so then I start, I start asking the question: Well, does he, does data even meet the criteria of an asset? And whether you look at a dictionary definition or an accounting definition of what an asset is, data clearly meets the criteria. It's something that's owned and/or controlled. Data is something that is exchangeable for cash, and data is something that generates probable future economic benefits. It's also separable from other assets. Those are the criteria of what an asset is, and there's, there's no question that, that, uh, that data meets, meets those criteria. Again, we're just kind of stuck in this 90-year-old kind of history of really not recognizing it for the most part. There are some rare circumstances where data's value can be on the balance sheet, and I'll share some of those with you. Then I ask the question, well, do companies that are more are, are companies that are more serious about managing data, m measuring data, uh, leveraging data um, as an actual asset, do they benefit in some way? And as it turns out, yes. Some research we did found that, that, data, uh, that, that data savvy companies, for example, those with chief data officers, with data science organizations, and with enterprise data governance functions, again, um, uh, indicators that they're serious about managing, governing, leveraging the data as an asset. Um, and putting some um, some executive resources uh, around it, uh, those kinds of companies have a market to book value ratio that's nearly two times higher than the market average. This is not two percent or twenty percent, but two hundred percent. Now, I'm not here to claim there's some causal effect there, but it's it's certainly a, a correlation that is um, is, is you know, significant and, and very very interesting and perhaps telling. We also found um, that companies that are data product companies that make a living selling data or data derivatives have a market to book value ratio that's nearly three times higher than the market average. So there's really no, I think, better argument for your, your executives to become more data driven, more data savvy, or even start selling data derivatives of some kind, whether they're reports or analyses or maybe even uh, subscriptions to, to data access themselves. So um, um, some, some really interesting uh, data there. So this takes us to this concept of, of um, what, what I've coined infonomics, the economics of, of information. Uh, and and as, as I mentioned, I started looking at the, the valuation of data. So we helped some of those companies in the Twin Towers um, understand the value of their data and, their, and the impact and the impairment on their business. Um, then we started thinking, or oh, what else? What are the other things we do to or with assets? Well, we manage assets, right? And so there are asset management principles and practices. We also measure them, um, and I think the way this kind of all fits. To, uh, sorry, we also monetize them. We generate value from them. So uh, I think the way this all fits together kind of goes back to the old adage, which is you can't manage what you don't measure, right? Or you can't manage well what you don't me measure well. Um, I don't know if Tom Peters or somebody you know first said that, but. Um, so I, I think you know the way this works is that uh, it's kind of a vicious cycle for for organizations that because they're not measuring the value of their data, most organizations aren't even measuring data quality on a regular and reporting on data quality on a regular basis, or even what data they have, um, and because they don't measure it, uh, they're in a poor position to get the resources um, and the support for managing it as an asset. And again, any asset that you're not managing very well is one that you're not going to be able to optimize the monetization or the economic benefits that are derived from it. So the idea behind Infonomics and the work that we're doing at West Monroe is to help our clients kind of reverse that curse, as we Cubs fans used to say, until we finally won the World Series. Um, and uh, so that is uh, reversing the curse or kind of kind of flipping flipping the script. So that's kind of the idea. I'm going to give you kind of a quick summary of, of each of these ideas. Um, and. Uh, and so let's start with, with uh, data monetization. So it's good to kind of start with the end in mind. So let's look at that. There are a number of myths around data monetization uh, that we find when we, when we start talking to clients is, well, they think data must be sold to be monetized. Well, that's not it at all. In fact, the concept of selling data really doesn't make a lot of sense because you want to maintain ownership of your data. Yes, you can license data, but I wouldn't necessarily call it, s there's a difference between really selling and licensing. Um, it doesn't have to. Uh, it doesn't require an exchange of cash. We can exchange other goods and services. Um, you could actually monetize data that's not your own. Uh, uh, there's also circumstances where data that you just hold, have and hold onto 
can generate value even if you're not using it, which kind of gets away from something that you hear from a lot of pundits, which is, well, data only has value once you use it. Well, that's entirely inconsistent with the way that accountants value other kinds of assets and, uh, and actually provably wrong. So um, I know we're not going to uh, get into too much of that here. Um, and that you don't have to be in the data business to monetize data. Uh, many business to the businesses today are creating data or data derivatives or selling or licensing their data or exchanging it with business partners or suppliers in return for um, certain kinds of commercial um, uh, advantages. Um, and then I'm going to skip to, to the bottom one, <clears throat> which is um, due to uh, privacy regulations, we can't monetize our customer data. Well, uh, we hear that a lot, and that's, again, entirely untrue because companies are just not being creative enough about this. And I'll, I'll actually cover um, uh, what we call an inverted data monetization method, which uh, allows you to, to monetize your, your customer data. Right, so this kind of leaves us with the question, what is data monetization? And our simple you know, answer to that or simple definition is that uh, data monetization is a process of generating measurable value streams or economic value from available data assets. So uh, a few things to unpack there. One is it's a process, okay? So it's not a one-time thing. If you want to really do this well, it should be a process. You should treat it very much like any other kind of like uh, pro product sort of approach. Uh, the second is uh, measurable value streams. Yes, we're already using data to generate value in the organization, but are we actually measuring? Are we attributing the value that we're generating from using data, from making better decisions or automating or optimizing something? Are we actually attributing that back to the, the data? Are we connecting the dots between that and the, and the data itself? Um, when you are, then it's a lot easier to claim that you're, you're monetizing it. And then, sec and then third is available data assets. Um, I already mentioned that companies can monetize data that's not necessarily their own, and uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, as well, so let's get into the various ways to, to monetize data. So, when I, uh, I, I when I uh, for about the past ten years or so, I've been compiling um, examples of how to monetize, uh, how organizations are monetizing or generating value from measurable value from data. Um, I've got about five or six hundred uh, examples in in my library that that we use to kind of inspire um, or shame <laughs> our uh, clients into into doing more with their data. Um, and they tend to fall, when I've kind of done a meta-analysis of them, they fall into a few different patterns, uh, both indirect data monetization in which we're using data more internally to generate value, and external or direct data monetization. Um, so let's look at those. So indirect data monetization um, includes you know, improving business process performance. That's great, but are you actually measuring the impact on having or not having data on that business process. Uh, we can also use data to um, reduce risk or improve compliance, uh, develop new products or markets, particularly gathering data from social media to identify new opportunities for uh, um, for introducing new, new products or entering new markets. We can also digitalize existing products or services, so think about any product or service you offer today and how you can create a more data-oriented or digital version of, of that. Um, data is definitely at the core of anything that we're doing today that's, that's digital. Um, we can use it to improve uh, partnerships and, and accelerate the, the performance of those partnerships. Um, and then a couple of uh, interesting ways. One is assetizing data on the balance sheet. Not something that I talked about originally in, in uh, Infonomics because it's really just kind of come to the fore in the last uh, couple of years, uh, which is, let me explain. So remember, data can't be a balance sheet asset. However, you can move the ownership of that data into a subsidiary, into a special purpose vehicle, a separate company, and then take ownership of that company. And that company's value is based on the value of its data. So you can go to an outside you know, accounting firm, or uh, we, we work with a, a firm that will do that, those valuations. Uh, we actually do the valuations, then they, they sign off on it. Um, and then the value of that subsidiary is now on the balance sheet of the parent company. So it's kind of a little bit of accounting shenanigans, but it's a way that if it's important to your investors or for you for a variety of reasons, like taking out loans, um, to uh, uh, recognize the value of your data on your, your company's actual balance sheet. Um, and then uh, this publishing branded indices is a way that if you're making data available to others, as we'll talk about in a moment, um, I recognize creating an index that you publish and publicize to make it known that you have data available. So a great example of this is um, the payroll processing company, uh, ADP, right? So you know ADP. So ADP um, um, has a, a, a viable business making millions of dollars selling data that they collect from their, or licensing data that they collect from their um, workforce management and, and payroll processing uh, applications. 
um, which are mostly SaaS apps, so they collect a lot of data on, on employment and, uh, and, and payroll and so forth. They aggregate all that up and they sell insights and reports on that. And one of the things that they do is they produce uh, an employment index, which is known to be more timely and more accurate than even the U.S. government's own, own numbers. Um, they don't publish it just to poke a finger in the eye of the Bureau of Labor Statistics. They, they publish it to you know, prove and, and, and advertise that they've got, promote and advertise that they have data available for, for licensing. So let's move on to the direct data monetization. Um, we can, of course, barter or uh, uh, trade data for non-commercial considerations. Um, can anyone suggest to me why that might be a, a better option than actually um, selling your data for cash? Well, you could, um, you mentioned before that data is growth. Data mm -hmm. naturally produces more data. Well, yeah. they now have more data available to me. I'm going to get opportunities for that data to grow. Right. But how, how is that different? How is exchanging it for, for, for goods and services a benefit over exchanging it for cash. You get a book. <laughs> Come up afterward, okay? Tax advantages, right? Now, I'm not here to give tax advice. We don't, at West Monroe, we don't give tax advice. But um, the reality is that if you're exchanging data for goods and services, there typically are no tax implications. I've heard otherwise from some uh, retailers that the IRS is kind of onto that. But, but think about it. You go into the grocery store, you scan your loyalty card, you get free food in exchange for information about your purchase. They call it a discount because it makes us feel good, but we, we, know, what's, we know what's happening. Um, of course, we can also license data through data brokers or data marketplaces. There's an inc increasing class of data aggregators and marketplaces that make uh, platforms available either, either externally or that you can even white label the platform internally to monetize your, your data. Um, you can sell uh, insights, analysis, and reports uh, of data rather than just selling the, the raw data, of course. Um, and when I say selling, I, also, I really mean licensing. Um, you can enhance your products and services using data. Think about any product or service you offer today, and maybe you already have kind of baked data or analysis or insights uh, into it. We're talking about taxes, so think about TurboTax, right, the tax preparation software. Um, there's lots of data baked into that, not only the entire you know, U.S. tax code, but you get analyses and reports based on your, your uh, propensity to be you know, audited and, and things like that. Um, you can also, uh, I mentioned the inverted data monetization model. So again, here's the scenario. I can't sell you my customer data, right, uh, because of privacy regulations, uh, GDPR, HIPAA, California Consumer Privacy Act, et cetera, the whole patchwork of, of privacy regulations. However, I can sell your stuff to my customers, right? something that I don't offer, but maybe is related to the products and services that I offer, um, I can make your products and services available to my customers without ever exposing who they are externally. And in return, I take a commission or a referral fee. This kind of stuff is happening all the time, thinking about the way you know Facebook works, for example, in, in promoting ads. They're not selling my data <laughs> anymore to, um, supposedly, anymore. <laughs> <laughs> To, uh, to, to retailers, but they're promoting retailers' goods and services on, on my page based on an understanding of my, um, my, my profile. Um, and then taking, a, obviously, a commission uh, on that. And then finally, we can collateralize data to secure loans. So uh, this is something that the airlines did in order to stay aloft, um, pun intended, during the uh, early days of the pandemic. And uh, so they were like, well, what, what, can we, what can we use to take out loans? What, what can we collateralize? Well, you, you would think they would collateralize their airplanes, their aircraft. But in fact, they're leased, so it gets a little more complex to collateralize those, those lease agreements. But what do they own? Well, they own their customer data. They own their customer loyalty program data. So they reached out to the US government and some large banks, and they said, uh, we want to uh, um, collateralize our, our customer loyalty programs, i.e. The, the customer data. And the, uh, the banks and the government said, yeah, we'll, 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 we will valuate that at uh, about 20 to $30 billion for, for American Airlines and United Airlines, which at the time was like two to three times the value of the companies themselves. So think about this. The value of your company's data may be more valuable than the company itself. Okay. All right. Moving on, uh, how do we take a, how do we monetize data? Well, uh, the, the approach that we kind of laid out at, at West Monroe for, for our clients, and, um, and there's kind of a high level look at, at this in the book, which is to take a product management approach. I think it's kind of irresponsible to, to do anything otherwise. Um, and so in the first phase, we work on generating um, and refining ideas and then kind of assessing those ideas. Uh, the second phase, we develop, develop the markets. We do some more market analysis. We identify the data assets that we're using. We define the support, maintenance, 
uh, 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 monitoring and, and reporting kinds of requirements. And then in the third phase, you kind of go into the build, right? Building the data products, rolling them out, and, and so forth. You'll notice this takes a very formal, data, uh, very formal product management approach, which is, um, um, you know, I think the, the, the right way to, to go about this. I'm kind of the first one to admit there's not a lot new in Infonomics. It's about borrowing ideas from other disciplines, and so this is a great example of that, which is taking a real product management approach to um, to monetizing your data. Some of the things that we do up front in the workshops are we look at uh, what are the uh, different forms of data monetization, which I just showed you. We look at uh, a businesses, what are its kind of primary and secondary business drivers, not only for them, but for potential buyers or users externally of the data. We look at what others are doing um, within and outside their, their industry. You know, we, we often get asked, um, and I've been asked this for years, you know, what are others in our industry doing? And my, my flippant response to that is, you know, why do you want to be in second place, right, or third <laughs> place, right? So, um, so we'll look at what others in other industries are doing, like um, the city of Los Angeles. Um, somebody identified that, well, goodness, uh, crimes kind of follow a pattern, much like aftershocks, uh, seismic aftershocks. So they applied seismic aftershock prediction algorithms to, um, to uh, crime maps um, and, and crime data uh, and uh, to identify where subsequent crimes were likely to occur and they uh, ended up reducing violent crimes by 30, 30%. So uh, the, the company formed based on this, I think they're called Pred, Predpol, uh, Predictive Policing. And so it's great, you know, great to think outside your industry and what are others doing with data and analytics and apply that to your own business. Um, we also look at the data needs and wants of the entire business ecosystem. Again, not just your immediate users and not just your immediate partners and suppliers, but your partners, suppliers, and your suppliers, partners, and your customers, partners, and your customers, other suppliers, who might find some of this data that you have potentially valuable. And then, of course, we look at the variety of data assets, um, not just inside the organization, but also outside. Um, um, open data, syndicated data, harvested web content, um, social media, et cetera. And then dark data as well, data that you know, maybe is hidden and, and kind of forgotten about in your, in your organization. There's some great examples of companies realizing they're sitting on a gold mine of archived data that, that uh, provides some real, real uh, value. Um, and then we do some hypothesis generating activities as part of that workshop. Typically, when we're done, we've generated 50 to 60 um, ideas, um, uh, but then you gotta kind of prioritize them. Um, so we go into a process of identifying, um, and I'll show you this in, in just a moment. Um, but I wanted to mention also that the kind of uh, the ideas that we've, we've compiled, and um, so I mentioned um, uh, I, I, that you know, I've got the Infonomics book. I'm soon to come out with a compilation of, of use cases as more of a reference book for organizations to kind of inspire or uh, shame them <laughs> into doing more with, with data, and that book's called uh, Data Juice. So if you're interested, uh, reach out to me. I'll put you on the list for... Uh, um, to, to get notice when, when, it, uh, when it publishes. It should be about a month or so away. Um, and each story actually includes a, uh, a commentary by one of uh, dozens of different experts in the industry. So yeah, my wife told me if I ever wrote another book, it would have to be titled, How I Use Big Data to Find My Next Wife. Um, and so, um, so I said, well, how about if I crowdsource this, <laughs> the next book? She goes, whatever that means, that's okay. <laughs> so we have a question, sir? Uh, yeah, go ahead, I'm, okay. and I'm going to do a time check. Who's, who's my timekeeper? Great. Okay. Right. So just like other kinds of assets that are intangible assets, the question was around how do you gauge the value of data as it changes over time. Just like other kinds of assets uh, get impaired or, or increase in value over time based on their utilization or based on their you know, decreased utilization or de decreased relevancy, uh, we recommend a periodic assessment of, of data value, whether that's a, a semi-annual or, 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 or annual, to try to track those changes. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Um, all right, let's get into... Um, Managing data as an asset. So, um, uh, one of the things I do with with organizations is is uh, uh, review and help them create their their um, data strategy, their their enterprise data strategies. And so, I'm reviewing a data strategy document from a, a public utility um, in the southeast, and and uh, and they say, 
I, I'm reading the document and, and I say, it starts out with saying, you know, data is our most critical corporate asset. We want to manage data as an asset. Most, most doc, similar documents say the same thing. So I say, well, uh, that's great, but there's nothing in your document about, about you know, um, inventorying your data. Like, how, how are you going to manage something as an asset if you don't, you know, know what you have? I mean, imagine a retailer with no inventory on their store shelves or a CFO with no chart of accounts or an HR executive with no corporate directory. Those would be dismissible offenses for those, those executives. So I said that to them, and they, they're like, yeah, you know, maybe, you know, maybe we, we should, you know, we, 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 um, we, we manage our, uh, our inventory, our trucks, and our transformers, and our generators, and, and you know, maybe we should do this with data as well. I said, well, yeah, if you're, if you're going to treat it as an asset, you sure should. But anyway, I go after the meeting, I go into the, the men's room, and this is what I see. They've inventory tagged their urinals and sinks and toilets. <laughs> so there's like, there's like this uh, you know, ironic or di dichotomy out there about organizations um, who are um, you know, inventorying things that don't matter and measuring things that don't matter, but not measuring their, their, their data. So enough looking at toilets. So, um, so where do we find inspiration, uh, sources of inspiration for managing data as an asset? There's a whole host of ISO standards for managing everything from IT assets to physical assets to supply chain to human capital, library science. They all have great relevancy and, and, and applicability to the way that, that data is going to be managed. I'm not going to go into details here today. Uh, again, in the, in the book, and um, the, you know, we do go into some uh, an exploration of how to adapt concepts from each of these uh, asset management principles. But my basic recommendation is, hey, if you're a physical service company, like a retailer or a manufacturer, apply you know, PAS 55, physical asset management, to the way that you're managing your data. If you're a financial services firm, apply financial standards and methods uh, and, and techniques to the way you're managing your data. If you're a human capital kind of firm, apply human capital management. Um, methods and, and me messages. This all kind of gets back to data literacy as well. If you're using the language of, of your business in describing how you're managing data, it gets you that much closer to being able to communicate and collaborate better with the, with the business people in your organization. And then finally, I'm just going to say a few words about measuring data as, a, as an asset. There's a variety of reasons why we would want to measure data as an asset to in, improve culture, to get budget and resources, to identify data that is maybe costing us more than the economic value that it's generating, and maybe we should dispose of it or, or move it to a, a slower, cheaper uh, medium. Um, um, the assetizing data. Um, uh, um, inspiring or again shaming business people to do more with their data so measuring data's uh, value is, is important in, in a variety of ways now there's a couple main different ways to, to measure a uh, data asset and, and some are foundational where we look at the kind of the intrinsic value its quality characteristics and its scarcity gives us an idea of how valuable that asset potentially is or how it compares to other assets data assets we can look at the business value of information you know how, how usable that data is we can look at its performance value and, and, and run an experiment to see how does having or not having this data actually impact business KPIs. Or we can do the same thing that uh, accountants and valuation experts do in, in measuring the cost basis of data, its market value, and its impact on, on, on revenue or expense savings. Um, and then using a couple of those, like cost and economic value, we could actually come up with, um, and we've just completed uh, doing this for a, a large pharmaceutical company, uh, valuating their data assets in terms of their ROA to the company um, and the margin that they're generating on those data assets. So as this gentleman suggested, it's something that they're going to want to do on a periodic basis to ensure that, one, they're driving down the costs of managing their data and at the same time increasing the value that that data is, is driving and delivering to the, uh, to the organization. Um, there's some really great examples in, in the book uh, how organizations are juxtaposing various um, instances of these models to drive certain kinds of behaviors in their, uh, in their organization. So just to wrap up, um, just some, uh, some high-level recommendations. You know, monetize your data, not only your data, but others' data in a variety of ways. Don't get just fixated on one way to do this. Data is a non-rivalrous, non-depleting, non-rivalrous, uh, non-rivalrous, non-depleting, regenerative, progenitive asset. So take advantage of those characteristics. Um, manage your data with the same discipline as you manage your other, other assets, and then measure and improve your data's potential value and, and its the actual value that it's uh, delivering. They're also uh, uh, kind of an exploration of uh, economic principles related to data. It's something that I do with my, my MBA students at uh, University of Illinois. We look at how to apply various kinds of economic models to data. You know, most economic models were designed with traditional goods and services in mind, you know, guns and butter and all that, right? And so we look at how do they apply things like uh, uh, marginal utility, um, 
um, supply and demand, pricing and elasticity, how do those concepts apply to data, and what can business professionals and data professionals kind of take away from, from that. So um, here's a little bit about how to, how to reach me. Um, the book is available in a uh, hard copy um, e-book e and, and uh, an audio book, uh, and also here today, right? And um, um, some ways to reach me, some things that we do at West Monroe, including uh, data asset strategy, uh, data monetization workshops, as I mentioned. We also do data asset valuations. Um, and for M&A purposes, we also help companies with their uh, evaluating the data on the sell side and also on the buy side of the target companies um, that they're looking to, to acquire. Um, so, all right, well, thank you, everyone. Great to be here. All right, so this gentleman, this gentleman gets a book. Yep, all right, and we have, let's not forget about the folks in the other room too, right? Right, okay, what we are gonna ask them about birthdays. Yeah, whoever's birthday in the overflow room is closest to today, come on over and uh, we'll get you, get you a copy of the book, yeah. And then the third book is, uh, can anyone tell us what the uh, World Economic Forum has estimated the value of data worldwide to be? We'll take the closest answer. 20 trillion. <laughs> Getting close, two trillion? It's three, you can have it. Okay. Three trillion, there you go. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you, Doug.